Let's have a word of prayer and we'll go where the Lord directs us. Father, we thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. And above all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his precious blood, for your holy written word, and for the mighty Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into the truth and brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus said. It is with great joy, unspeakable, and full of glory that we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping, thanking you in advance for anointing our ears, minds, hearts, and souls to receive the engrafted word. And Father, we welcome and invite the supernatural of God to be in manifestation in this service, even as the Spirit wills. And for all that shall be said, wrought, revealed, and manifested, we covenant to give you and you alone all of the praise, the honor, and the glory with adoration and with thanksgiving, for we do it in Jesus' mighty name. And Lord, thank you for anointing this festival of clay to minister life to your people boldly, without fear, favor, or respect of persons, that your word may proceed as it does from your own mouth. It will not return to you void, but will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereunto it is sent. We believe we receive these petitions which we have desired of you, for we ask them in the mighty, matchless, and majestic name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. And everybody that agreed with that prayer said, Amen. Amen. They said, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And everybody say, Thank God for Jesus. God. Amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Those of you here in the in-person service, glory, 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 hallelujah. Well, folks, this is what is designated as the Holy Week. And the revelation of what is called the passion of Jesus. You know, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9. And uh, I want to make sort of a preemptive, if I may, introduction to this word today. And I'll just simply entitle this The Significance of Palm Sunday. Now, the significance of Palm Sunday. Now that's relevant to us as followers of Jesus or those of us who are considered to be citizens of the kingdom of God. I haven't said this, what I'm about to say in quite a while, and maybe if I say it, it might disturb some people a little bit, nothing rash. But I want you to understand that the first time those who were followers of Jesus were called or identified as being Christians was in the city of Antioch, which is in modern-day Turkey. Antioch, that's where they first called them Christians. Amen. And they were not uh, attempting to edify them. <laughs> it, it, it is what we would call an epithet or a slur. It was not meant to lift up, but to put down. Because the word itself literally means to be like Jesus. Okay, that's why they called them Christians, to be like the anointed one. And in that use and in that time, uh, as I said, it was, a, it was a put down, not a lift up. Now, the thing about it is, and I don't know if you're all ready for this either. That's why I tell you, you, some of you might find what I'm about to say disturbing. Jesus never used the word. At least I'll have to say, it was never recorded in Scripture that he used the word. Amen. So you might say, well, pastor, what are you trying to say? We're no longer Christians. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> if you're a follower of Christ, you'll always be a Christian. Amen. In the eyes of those typically who aren't even Christian. Amen. Okay. And, and you'll be a Christian to your fellow believers, Amen. your fellow citizens of the kingdom. Let me simply say in this introductory set of remarks, that we don't need to lose sight of, and you're going to understand the significance of it all, especially as we continue down the prophetic timeline of God. You must understand here, in fact, let's get to the, to the text. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, <coughs> lowly and riding upon an ass. I'm, I'm reading the authorized King James Version. So you know. <laughs> and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. You know, once upon a time, that three-letter word was absolutely taboo. But man, now in the culture we're living in, nothing is taboo in the, in the eyes of the world. Amen. 
But nevertheless, I'm reading it literally and directly from the King James. Now, y'all might can use the word donkey, and that's fine, you know, burrow, whatever you like. But this is a very significant thing, and this is the prophet Zechariah. Now, he's saying these things a long time before this ever happens. This is a long time out from Jesus' literal triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem on the back of a little donkey. All right? Notice, I want to read it again. Rejoice greatly. So the significance of this entire act is an act of rejoicing. This is, this is a celebratory event in every respect. O oh, daughter of Zion, shout. Oh, this is shouting ground, all of this. O oh, daughter of Jerusalem, behold thy king. Now, you know, I've told you before <laughs> that the Bible is a book essentially about a king and about his kingdom. If you ever wondered why in the world did humanity, after it ultimately emerged out of the Garden of Eden, see like everybody, every little group of folks that gathered together. Now, you know, the Tower of Babel was the place where God confounded the languages of the folk. Because God said, look, these folks are saying the same thing. All of them speak the same language. And, and he said, now, look at what they're trying to do. They're trying to build a tower to reach heaven. You know, that all that has significance. <laughs> folks have been trying to do that, and they're still trying to do that Amen. in their own way. Amen. Oh, yeah. You know, that was, that was their way. That was Nimrod and his crowd's way of trying to say, hey, you know, God, we can reach you. Uh, apart from whatever it is, the way you say we can reach you. Amen. And folks still believe that to this day. You know, when Nimrod died, the spirit that was in him didn't. That's right. Amen. Oh, yeah. And that was thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. Amen. And yet that same spirit Thanks. is taking up occupancy That's right. in someone or someones Amen. in the world today. Now, they're not literally cut, you know, put stacking block up, blocks up to, and all this kind of thing. It's a different methodology now. Back then, it was a literal effort. They were literally attempting to build a tower to reach heaven. And I mean, think about it. They, they were really engaged in that thing. Stop to think for a minute. Where did they get the architectural skills? Where did they get the, the, the construction understanding to even engage in that. Folks are still asking the questions today about the pyramids and other wonders of the world. You know, there were certain ancient wonders of the world and there are modern wonders of the world and folks are, you know, you ever see these little reality shows? They're, they're nonfiction. They come on some of those channels like the Discovery Channel or the History Channel or something like that. And they show you these incredible feats that men have accomplished here. I mean, just modern day wonders. You, see, you go out there and you, and frankly, you wonder how they do this. <laughs> how, did they, how did this, ha what a wonder this is. And when you stop to think what these things do. I mean, in my opinion, man, the Panama Canal was a wonder for that matter. You, you just cut out <laughs> across an entire, you know, peninsula there, man. And just, and ships just go through those locks all the time, all the time. Transverse, traversing rather from the Atlantic to the Pacific or in reverse, whatever the case may be. Because I tell you what, if they didn't have it, it'd be a long way Amen. <laughs> around the South American continent or the North American continent. And if you're going to traverse up through there, you got to cut all the way through the ice in the North Pole. That's right. Amen. So, you know, guys were thinking, who gave them the insight and the revelation knowledge in order to be able to do these things? And I, and I said that to remind you that this is the same God to whom we have access. Amen. In whom the scripture says in the New Testament, in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. And I said all that to say this, there's absolutely no need to live in fear Amen. or in intimidation Amen. or in frustration or in anxiety. What does the scripture says? It says rejoice. Don't just rejoice, rejoice greatly. Amen. Go out of the way rejoicing. Amen. Remember David, 
when the Ark of the Covenant came back, the Bible said that David literally danced out of his clothes. That's right. He was so glad for the Ark of the Covenant to be returned. And of course, this upset some folks because some people are not as enthusiastic as you might be. His own wife got upset with him. Yeah, I saw you down there dancing like a fool in front of all them women. <laughs> David had to set her straight, girl, before I knew you. You don't know what this is. I got you after I took Goliath out because that's what your daddy promised me. I'm just talking colloquially here, okay? okay all right? That, that was the deal. The deal was whoever takes out this menace called Goliath, he's going to be a free man in Israel. And the king's going to give him his daughter's hand in marriage. That's right. Amen. <laughs> He's going to be tax free. Glory to God. You'd have took out 10 Goliaths if you had that promise, I tell you what. <laughs> but you see, what she wasn't understanding is she wasn't there when David approached. When the Philistines had arrayed themselves against the Israelites to take them out. And when David heard the challenge given by Goliath, he said, now hold on a minute. Who is, this is what David said when he heard it. Now, all these, these seasoned soldiers, man, were cowering and shaking. But, and David's just approaching innocently to bring some, uh, you know, vittles and groceries to, to the front lines and a special gift to the king from his, his daddy, Jesse. And so he, he, he hears this stuff, and it doesn't hit his ears the same way it hit the other guys. And David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he has the gall I'm amplifying a little bit, that he has the gall, the audacity to curse the armies of the living God. Living God. It, in other words, David said, it is obvious that this fellow has no connection with God. That's right. Amen. He has no covenant. He has no contract. He has no relationship, as it were, with the Most High God. And David knows that, at, at, listen, as one of the tribes of Israel, as, as a part of Israel, as a part of God's kingdom, he knew this guy was no match for the Most High God. Right. Amen. And I'm saying to you, and I keep saying it over and over again, we need to walk continually in a confident expectation and knowledge of these things. Amen. This is not just ancient history I'm reading Amen. to you. This is still literally pertinent truth right. for us as God's people today. Amen. So rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. A king, not a religious person, not a religion, a king with a kingdom. Amen. And you're going to need to really embrace that concept and that understanding, as I said, as we continue down God's prophetic timeline. You know, this is not a battle out here in our modern times, although many people think that it is, of religion against the kingdoms of men. The, the Bible all throughout identifies e even the future generations as, quote, being the kingdoms of men. Amen. So whatever government, doesn't matter whether it's socialistic, communistic, democratic, the, whatever it is, uh, uh, what's the other one? Dictatorship. That doesn't make any difference. From the vantage point of God, all of them represent the kingdoms of men because this is how God kicked this thing off. It's no accident, as I said, that when humanity finally emerged out of the Garden of Eden, when God scattered them and, and confounded their languages at the Tower of Babel in the plains of Shinar, it's no accident they, they found each other's language, they grouped together and what out, and, and they went out there and they formed, if you would please, monarchies. Amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kings over their particular kingdom and area. They staked out territory. Amen. Come on, somebody. They Amen. staked out territory, Amen. each one of them. All the ites, That's the right. parasites. Yeah. The Hivites. Right. We, we got newites today, hippocrites. <laughs> right. They all <laughs> stake out territory. Yeah, uh, thank God you all got that. Okay. If you didn't get it, just ask somebody. They'll tell you. Anyway, so they all staked out territories. This is our property. And these are our borders. And we consider it an act 
a potential transgression if you cross our borders right. without having business with us Amen. and so forth and so on. It's the same issue Amen. is still up to this day. Right. It, it is. Think about it, and I'm not, uh, you know, stirring up a wasp nest or anything, but listen, in order to travel internationally, now things are a little bit weird these days, but I'm just saying to travel internationally, you have to have a passport Amen. to grant you entry into a nation and, and, and absolutely to get you back into your own nation. Amen. I remember when we traveled internationally, the, the people at the State Department said, look, you need to make a copy of your passport and you need to leave one with a loved one where you live, your home country, and also pack another one in a place separate from where you keep your actual passport. So that if in the uh, hopefully unlikely occasion you lose it, there's proof of who you are. Amen. That's not the same thing as the real deal, but at least, <laughs> at least you got proof positive. Look, I had a passport. That's my picture on there. And there's all the pertinent information. And that's how you move about from, from place to place. Well, it, you're, God doesn't need a passport. He doesn't need a visa. Amen. A visa is the thing that permits you to go into a nation. You know, I remember when we went to China, we had to have a visa in order to go into that, that nation. Usually, typically, visas are given to nations or countries that may not necessarily be in diplomatic, uh, friendly territory. Amen. With the United States, it's kind of how the deal is, you know. If they don't recognize you, well, you need a visa. We got to give you specific kind of permission to be in our country and to do this. That's why people come in on work visas and things like that. Well, the point I'm making to you is it says a king is coming in there. And I want to remind you that a king is a political term, Amen. It's a political position. Amen. You have a king, a prime minister, a governor, a mayor, Amen. a councilman, an alderman, a commissioner. These are, these are political offices and positions. Amen. From the Greek ecclesia, which is translated church in the English Bible, it means a governing council. Amen. So when Jesus comes back, ladies and gentlemen, he's not going to put his feet on the Mount of Olives and have a revival. He is coming. Listen, when he comes back, he's coming to reckon with the kingdoms of men. Amen. Why? Because he's the king <clears throat> of the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> and not only that, he's king of kings and Lord of lords, and he's coming to reckon. As you go through the stories of Jesus, the parables, and all of his adventures and all of his encounters, you, there are many stories and parables that talk about. For example, where a guy went into a field and planted tares in the field of wheat. And the guys tending to the field said, well, wait a minute. Shall we go in here and uproot these tares? But the Lord said, no, don't do that. Because in the course of it, you may uproot wheat in the process of trying to get rid of the tares. Why? Because tares and wheat are very difficult to tell apart at a certain stage of their development. And even when you can distinguish them, it's a little bit dangerous because if you're going to try to uproot the wrong thing, you may very well disturb the right thing in the process of doing it. Amen. That's business best left up to God. Amen. Oh, my Lord. Amen. Watch out here now because, see, a lot of us, man, you know, we see one another and we say, <clears throat> you got to be careful. That's why the Lord said, judge ye not, lest you be judged. Listen, you're going to try to uproot somebody, and in the course of it, you may bring out something good. Why? Because we as followers of Jesus, we as citizens of the kingdom, we're all growing and maturing and learning. Amen. Amen. And it is difficult sometimes to assess what stage or level people are at. But, you know, just like, now, hold on a minute, God always gives us good examples and, and illustrations to follow. Uh, how many of y'all in here have raised children? All right, let the record show that's about everybody. <laughs> Some of y'all didn't raise your hand because you are children. But anyway, that's okay. Okay. Uh, well, see, that's the whole thing. You know, even in, even in the church, I'm talking about our local church family, it's like a family. Amen. And it's like raising kids, Amen. in a sense. I'm not calling you kids. I'm just saying that's, that's sort of what it is. But it's from the context of uh, 
developing citizens of the kingdom of God. And by the way, if you never thought about it, I got news for you. You're going somewhere with that. Amen. Don't think that you're being a part of a local assembly like this, the Body of Christ Church International USA, that you're just going through some motions to learn how to be good, sweet, little Christian uh, believers. God always has a purpose. Always remember this, my brothers and sisters, as long as you live and even beyond, yes, even beyond, that God is always in the business of taking you from a place to a place. And he has a purpose for all of that. Did you ever stop to think for a minute, what's your place going to be when you finally get to heaven? Did it ever occur to you that that place might be predicated on what you're dealing with and doing now? Come on, amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Have you never read in the scripture where it says that in that great day of judgment, there are two judgments, the great white throne judgment that will ultimately dismiss those that would not have Jesus over them Remember that story in the field I was just telling you about? Well, you know, the Lord said, an enemy has done this. An enemy came in here and planted the wrong stuff in the middle of the field. He's still doing it. That's why Jesus said, you need to pray there for the Lord of the harvest because you need his eyes and his ears and his insight and his discernment in order to do what it is he's called you to do. Amen. Amen. It's time to wake up, Glory everybody. Amen. Like Teddy Bettergrass used to say with Harold Melvin and them. Amen. I always like to throw in a little bit, you know. Glory. It's time to wake up, everybody. Amen. No more sleeping in bed. That's right. right? Okay, now. Yeah, I know the tune's running through your head. I'll let you enjoy that for a second. <laughs> But yes, God is absolutely moving us from a place to a place. Amen. Now, what point is there? Jesus said, now, my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And he said, I'm, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's confirmation that after you leave here, you're going somewhere else. And that's not to be looked upon with grievance and sorrow and sadness. Now, we all know that the, the method of transition to do that leaves those who are still in the from sad. But for the people who are going to, they're glad. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There is no better company to be in. The Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice for every sinner that repents. They know. They're there. They know the advantage, the benefit, this thing about rejoicing greatly and shouting and what that's all about. The other thing that's significant about this verse, Zechariah 9 and 9, it says of this king, he is just yes. and having salvation. That's the, the power of a king, of a real king, is that he can take care of his subjects. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Right. But it says he's lowly. Yeah. He's not puffed up, not prideful, not arrogant. That's what it means by lowly. Doesn't it, way, it doesn't say low. It says lowly. Amen. That's an adverb. Amen. doesn't say he's low, which is an adjective. It says he's lowly, Amen. an adverb, meaning that he is of humility. Yes. Jesus was called the Lamb of God Amen. that taketh away the sin of the world, <clears throat> but he was also <clears throat> the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. So he had all the wherewithal to run a kingdom 
and to manage the kingdom, but he also had, as, we, as I pray daily, the goodness, the mercy, yes. the grace, and the compassion Amen. Amen. for all the subjects and citizens of the kingdom. And riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And you see, let me tell you the significance of this. This is what kings or potentates would do. By Jesus doing this very thing, and as it was prophesied by Zechariah years before it ever happened, the folks of those times recognized the significance of a potentate or a king riding in to a place on such a steep, uh, such an animal. Why? <clears throat> because you remember horses and chariots? You ever read about that in the Bible? I want to tell you something. <laughs> horses and chariots, man, represented big time conflict. Amen. Like war. That's right. Horses and chariots. Amen. You know, God sent some horses and chariots of fire That's right. to pick up the man of God, Glory. Elijah. Amen. He didn't come riding in there on a donkey now, everybody. He, he hey. <laughs> Get more now. <laughs> Somebody hollered, uh, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of God, and so forth and so on. I mean, he was amazed. Amen. And so for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem on the back of an animal like this, a lowly kind of, you know, they knew the significance of that. They knew that in their culture and in the, in the empire of the Romans, and they've seen things before, you know, the Jews survived through a lot of empires, ladies and gentlemen. They survived through the ancient Egyptians. They survived through the Babylonians. They survived through the Greeks. They survived uh, through the Medes and the Persians and the Romans. Whether you recognize it or not, because right now it doesn't look like what we read about there's still another empire to reckon with. <laughs> and so when Jesus touches the Mount of Olives, man, he's not coming to hold revival. Amen. You, you know what I'm saying? He's coming to reckon with the kingdoms of men. In other words, God will judge the nations of the world. Amen. Remember now, they're real. Jesus, no, pardon me. Satan offered them to Jesus right. at the Mount of Temptation. Hey, man, if you're the son of God, tell you what, uh, you see all these kingdoms and their glory, I'll give them all to you. All you have to do is bow down and worship me, and I'll hand them over. This was a genuine temptation. Amen. It was within Satan's domain, if you would, to make that offer. And of course, Jesus rejected that. He hit the devil again and again and again and said, it is written. In other words, he, the sword of the Spirit came out and brought the truth. And cut going in and cut coming out. Amen. And the Bible says the devil leaveth him. Amen. And he will leaveth you too. Amen. If you cut him with the sword. Glory to God. And declare and decree what is written. Amen. Don't let him have your children. Amen. Don't let him have your grandchildren. Amen. Don't let him have your mind. Amen. Don't let him have anything Amen. that is in your stewardship. Amen. Cut him out. That's what I call divine surgery. Amen. The devil and his stuff, man, is a cancer. It's a tumorous growth, man. Cut it out. God has given you the ultimate scalpel. That's right. Amen. You ain't have, you ain't heal. Listen, don't even apply anesthesia. Just cut him out. Amen. Glory to God. Let's go, let's go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Now, in Luke chapter 19, there's a lot going on here. And it starts off with Jesus entering and passing through Jericho. And he had the encounter with Zacchaeus. Oh, this is in Luke 19, all right? So it, you, you've got all this adventure, all of this encounter. And see, you know, Zacchaeus was a hated man. He had plenty of haters because he was a tax collector. And, and the folks hated tax collectors. You know, they still do to this day. You know? Right. <laughs> and so, uh, now notice here, go down to verse 11, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. 
And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. See, everybody's looking for a sudden flash out of the sky. Kill these Romans. Take us out of this occupation. Wipe out these crazy Caesars of Rome. That's what they mean by, they, they, they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. They ain't no man, God's got a plan and he's unfolding it. Amen. Listen to everybody, people in the marketplace ministry do this all the time. They do it all the time. Amen. They'll tell you everything, they, they bring it out, they unfold it. A little bit here and a little bit there. In other words, they're building it up to something. They're building it up to something. So it's a step and stage process. Where do they get that from? Obviously from God. Because this is what God is doing. That's why I always refer you and say to you often about God's prophetic timeline. There are events that are scheduled on that timeline. And each one of them represents an unfolding. Why do you think it's called the book of the revelation? It didn't just pounce out of heaven all at once. Kaboom! When Jesus revealed the revelation to John. He was unfolding a multifaceted picture of God's end time plan. Jesus showed John stuff that was going on in heaven and showed John things that were going on in earth and showed John things that were going on under the earth. There's like, there's three stages. What's that song? The whole world is a stage. And everybody plays a part. I tell you, I always slip these little things in there. I can't even remember the, what name of those boys did that song. But anyway, but that, that's essentially what it is. This world is a stage, Amen. and everybody's playing a part. Amen. And so the book of the Revelation, for those of you that struggle with it or strain with it, listen, it's unfolding to you, and reve that's what it reveals to you Amen. God's ultimate plan of the ages. Amen. He's telling you what is going to happen. Amen. Listen, get this straight. There is no chance That's right. no. of it not happening. Amen. That's right. It's going, going to happen. Yeah. That's right. Amen. We read the stories of Noah and Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, and you know, we read, well, these kinds of things. Jesus, but you know, Jesus said, as it was in those days, yeah. that's how it's going to be when he comes back. And, and you can't get a grip on that. Because you're looking at a big boat in the middle of dry land my, my, my. and rain falling for 40 days and 40 nights. You're looking at fire and brimstone falling from heaven on cities in the plain called Sodom and Gomorrah and wiping the place out and leaving scorched earth That's behind. Right. And you figure, well, what, what in the world would that look like in 2022 or 20 whatever, whenever that time comes? And yet, one of the most telling things that Jesus ever said was when he was dealing with the religious people of the day. And he, you know what? I got news for you, folks. He's still dealing with the religious people of the day. If Jesus had, you know, if God had advanced the timeline and rather than Jesus coming when he did, fast forwarded and let him show up today. <laughs> Y'all would be like the Jews back then. Right. You wouldn't know him if you saw him. Because right. he looked like you. Amen. You think he's going to show up in a Brooks Brothers suit <laughs> and roll up in a Cadillac limousine? No, not likely. Amen. I'm just looking at the way he was handling things when he was here. And he was able to basically, I don't, this is a tough word, but I, I'm going political a little bit here. He was able to infiltrate mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the nation of the Jews. Amen. Because those were the chosen people. So he, he had to come in looking like them, being like them, Amen. practicing the customs and the cultural aspects that they did. That's right. Amen. So when he rides into the city on the back of this foal of a colt, or a cold of a foe, uh, whatever. <laughs> These folks are recognizing this is not just any visitation here. That's right. This is significant. Amen. Amen. And yet, truly, if Jesus had come in this time, you wouldn't have really recognized him. You'd have to find a crowd and try to pick him out in it. 
you could probably hear him. I mean, if he did show up in this time, he'd have all kinds of technology to speak to us today. Right. Who knows? Maybe the iPhone and all of these digital devices and wireless things were, let me put it this way. Steve Jobs didn't get a, come up with it himself. Now, that's what history will say. Stephen Jobs invents iPhone. Well, where'd Steve get it from? Did you think that that was just gray matter showed up in his brain? Or was it possibly revelation knowledge? It, could it be that, could, could it be, uh, you know, I like to ask questions, I argue the scripture. Could it be that God said, I'm going to use Jobs and Gates to create, an, oh, you got a new fellow on the block, Musk now, right? right Elon Musk, right? Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to use Jobs and Gates and Musk to set up a network system such that when I get to another stage or place on the prophetic timeline, it, where the scripture says that every eye every, yeah, yeah. shall see him. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Mm. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm enjoying myself, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Yeah, These are very interesting right. things. Right. Amen. It's, it's what I've been trying to teach you all for 30 some years is how to be critical thinkers Amen. and not just have your brains one-sided. Critical thinkers. There's only one way you can really be a critical thinker. You've got to have the Spirit of God. Amen. You, listen to me. You've got to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. You've got to let Him lead you and guide you. It's the only way you're going to become a critical thinker. Otherwise, yeah, that wasn't supposed to happen. Anyway, other, otherwise, you, you, you'll just like dumb sheep. That's right. That's right. You'll go where anybody leads you. But the good news from the chief shepherd, the great shepherd is, my sheep know my voice. And a stranger they will not follow. That's the danger of not being a critical thinker. Because sheep are dumb. They don't have a leader. You stop and think about that for a minute. Remember my friend, Dr. Monroe, was, I love this saying. It stuck with me from the first moment I ever heard it come out of his mouth. He said that an army of sheep led by a lion would always defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. Why? The point is a sheep can't lead. And you can have lions and all kind of stuff, but if you got a sheep for a leader, you're in trouble. But a lion in charge is going to get something done. Amen. Now, you know, I've had to imagine that, what that would look like. I mean, could sheep really answer the call, even if a lion roared? Well, I'll tell you what, if a lion roars, they're going to scatter and do something. You know, Amen. they're not just going to sit there. But nevertheless, it sounds like a paradoxical phrase, but, but it's a very interesting principle to consider. So Jesus rides in here, and everybody knows the significance of this, is because this is how conquering kings, if you would please, would enter into territory. In other words, the hostilities, the hostilities are put aside. Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Luke 19, is that where we are? Look, what does verse 10 says? Now, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19, 10. In Luke 9, 56, Jesus said, the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So him riding in on the donkey and everybody throwing palm branches out there because this was a cultural thing. The palm tree, the palms represented peace. They represented that there was a cultural aspect to them. And they scattered them out on his pathway. The disciples put their cloaks and garments on the beast, if you would, on the, not uh, uh, wrong, wrong use of the word, uh, on the donkey, all right? And it had Jesus set on it, Amen. on his way in there. Amen. This was not some kind of a showboat thing. This was not some kind of a trick. This was not a publicity stunt. This yeah. carried significant meaning Amen. to everybody in Jerusalem and frankly, throughout the entire Roman Empire. If word got out to everybody, even to the even to Caesar. Why? Because that's what kings do. 
<clears throat> not long after all of this, you know, he's going to be facing crucifixion and the judgment seat uh, with Pilate and all that nonsense. And we'll talk about that in the next segment. But uh, this, this carried significant meaning because it's sending the message that, folks, the battle you've been having within yourselves with sin is over. Amen. Because I've conquered it. I've conquered death, yeah. hell, and the grave. Well, now he's yet to kind of do that because, you know, that's what the crucifixion and all that is Amen. about, right? Amen. He dies on the cross and then he's in the tomb three days and so forth and he's resurrected. So, again, those things are to come. Praise the Lord. All right. All right. So, once again, he goes on. I, was, I had stopped in Luke 19 and he said, Therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He called his ten servants, and some of you recognize this also from Matthew 25, or the parable of the pounds, the parable of the talents, and so forth. But I, may I point this to you? But his citizens, verse 14, notice the use of the word citizens. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. This is the same attitude that folks have today. That's right. Amen. Don't bring your Jesus to us. Don't tell us about him. We don't, want him. We don't even believe in him. We won't hear that. That's why systemically, my brother and sister, here we are wrestling with pronouns, genders, yeah. gender dysphoria, here we are wrestling with all kind of stuff that's not worth 15 cents worth of nothing. Amen. And people are becoming oblivious to eternity. My, my, my. And they, listen, listen to them. They're reasoning that if Jesus was really who he says he is, if he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, why be all of this tumult, turmoil, chaos, calamity, and confusion? My, my. Because he left it in charge with y'all. <laughs> and y'all's security deposit is coming due. The end of your lease is coming up. And he's coming to collect. And you can ignore him and pretend he's not coming if you want to, but he's coming. And he's going to collect. He is going to judge the nations of the earth. There will be a battle called Armageddon, and he will be the undisputed champion. Amen. Glory to God. He will be the winner. Amen. There will be a new heaven Amen. and a new earth yes. and a new Jerusalem. Yes. And he will rule and reign in the millennial kingdom for a thousand years after which Hello. Satan must be loosed for a little time. That's for another time. I can't, I can't unpack that right now. Because, see, love always has a choice. All this stuff's coming up. You might be sitting here today thinking, well, I'm glad I won't be around. Who told you that? Considering that no man knows the day or the hour. Who told you that? We've told you a little bit about what Jesus said about how is it you can tell the signs of the sky, but you can't tell the signs of the times. Y'all look to the east and you say, my goodness, man, uh, it's red out there. Storm's coming. And it's just true. It's a typical warning of a storm approaching. Amen. Was it red skies at, in morning, sailor take warning. Red skies at night, sailor's delight. Right. Red sky at night, sunset, man, beautiful weather, nice seas, calm. You can read the signs of the sky, but you cannot read the signs of the time. Amen. Listen to me. Spirits have been unleashed in our current situation today. Amen. Unlike anything you, have, you could ever really remember. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 see, man, it's almost like a fire hose coming in here. Listen, listen. You have to understand that the reason this stuff can happen and seemingly people are getting away with it is because, see, the enemy has been softening. You know what a food tenderizer is? Well, the devil's been pounding and tenderizing folk for decades. 
He really got an access in an event. Once the decree came down that prayer had to be outlawed in schools, that was it then. He said, okay, there won't be any more public discourse invoking the presence of God in the key institutions of the kingdoms of men. Thus, I will be able to move in with little to no resistance. That's where the culture is today. There's little resistance against perversion, against iniquity, against lies, against thievery, against abomination, against evil. There's a little resistance to it because the enemy has been able to release spirits into the earth realm to tenderize folks. Even, even some people who were staunch. What does the scripture say? Except the days be short. Even the very elect themselves would be deceived. That's deep. In other words, my brother says, you have to be doubly determined that you're not going to be among those falling away, committing apostasy, leaving the Lord. Where the scripture says, some have departed from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Man, Palm Sunday is a time to greatly rejoice and to shout because it symbolizes that Jesus is riding into the city. He's riding into the city as a conquering king, as a king who has overcome the world. Remember, he said, be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. For greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. And he's just coming straight down Broadway, man. The priests are there. The religious folks are there. The word is getting back to Caesar. The word has gotten to Pontius Pilate, the governor. What's going on out there? What's all this noise? Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Who is this they're talking about? Why are they throwing palm leaves? Why is he riding in there? Like he's a king. Well, Pilate would find it. He would eventually find out. He's going to interrogate Jesus. Are you a king? Jesus said, you said it. <laughs> but see, Jesus said, hold on a minute. Because Pilate was getting a little bit nervous. But Jesus said, you really don't have too much to worry about at the moment. Because if my kingdom was of this world, then my soldiers would come. You'd have never taken me. You know, folks, I have to sort of modernize it a little bit to help you understand these truths here. And again, I also want you to take away from this message today the fact that, again, God is in, listen, when he comes back, when all this goes down, I'm telling you right now, it, it, this, this religious issue is, is not the issue. The real issue, man, are the political dynamics where men decided they would not allow their kingdoms to be submitted to the kingdom of Almighty God. Amen. This is the reckoning. Because the Bible makes reference to the fact that the kingdoms of, of these guys will eventually become the kingdom of our God. Amen. That's what this thing is all about. It's a king and a kingdom. And listen, this is his territory. We were originally put here to manage it and keep it for him. Amen. But you know what we did? We ran a coup. Amen. <laughs> we, hold, hold on a minute. <laughs> Technically, we ran a bloodless coup, but he came back and ran a blood coup on us, as it were, the kingdoms of men. We said, hey, we, we're taking whole, total charge. God said, hold on, I'm spelling out your dominion. We don't want your dominion. That's too limited. We're taking the whole thing over. Amen. Lord said, that's not what I told y'all to do. Okay, I'm going to let y'all run with this thing for a while and see what you get. You know, excuse me, folks. You might say, well, Pastor, that's a little bit too colloquial. Too... No, 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 no. In the first chapter of Proverbs, God said to the folk that didn't want to listen to him and do, he said, you know, I'm going to laugh. Saturday Night Live gets a lot of laughs. Amen. But not nearly as many as God's going to get watching these folks doing what they're doing. He said, I will laugh when confusion comes and your chaos and calamity come on you and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to. We're, we're, listen, folks, we're, we're on the precipice of that right now. 
I'm telling you, the Bible has already predicted that the, listen to me, leaders in the nations of the world today are, are kind of hot, like Mount Carmel, between two opinions. They're hot. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to go about doing it. And no one wants to consult God. I'm not through. I just had to stop here. You all can understand that. But, you know, I know there will be many, many references, if I may dare say so, religious references to Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is what it is. Now, Palm Sunday really has literally almost next to no meaning, I'm just saying, uh, to the Jews, other than, that, other than that they recognize it is, has significant meaning to us as Christian believers, as followers of Jesus. For the Jews, this is the season of Passover coming up. Yeah, the season of Passover. That's what Easter is all about to them. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Yeah, right. So uh, understand that uh, we don't, and I'm just going to tell you, you're not going to hear too much about, shall I say, the political implications of all that's involved here with this Holy Week and all that is dealing with it, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter, all of that. But I thank God because we will help unpack that and help you understand that. Now, that listen, the purpose of the message is not to take away the meaning of it to you from a spiritual perspective because it is, as Zechariah said, a time to rejoice greatly and a time to shout. But the shouting and the rejoicing is not over how religious you become, but how free you become, how liberated you become. Amen? That sin shall no longer have dominion over you. That's what this was all about when Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but I came to save them. His triumphal entry into Jerusalem was a testament to the fact that he indeed was the one who would accomplish that goal. Amen. And the rest of the story, as they say, we'll do next week. Praise God. Well, we thank God for his word. We thank God for the presence and anointing of his Holy Spirit. And whoever you are, wherever you are, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. The Bible is not talking about a Monday, a Wednesday, a Friday, a Saturday, or Sunday, or any of those name days. It just says today. Meaning the present moment is always a good time for salvation. So as I said, whoever you are, wherever you are today, in the day that you hear my voice, saith the Lord, harden not your heart, but receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen. Receiving Jesus gives you the ultimate passport because there are no borders and boundaries to him. Amen. He's everywhere, Amen. all at the same time. Amen. And particularly and specifically through the person of the Holy Spirit, that's why he can indwell all of us. How many Christian believers are there? How many followers of Christ? How many citizens of God's kingdom are now presently occupying the earth? Well, I got news for you. Every one of them, every one of them has access to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has access to them. And you need to be one of those because when the, when the events of God's prophetic timetable begin to manifest themselves as they already have begun, then you will need that one who can supply you with not opinion, not speculation, not punditry, not perspective, but the truth. Say the truth. The truth. That's the only thing Jesus, Jesus did not say. You shall know this one's opinion. You shall know that one's platform. You shall know this one's perspective. No, he said you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm telling you, that in the days shortly to come, you're going to have to learn to rely. I mean, lean on steadfastly and immovable on the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. 
A amen. amen. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. Folks are making all kind of money to tell you what they think. And the Lord didn't ask you for a dime to tell you what is the truth. He just says, <laughs> glory to God. He says, take up your cross and follow him. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. And I invite those that are tuned in with us right now and those that are seated among us to come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Father, that they might pray this prayer of salvation. And I say to you, whoever you are, wherever you are, to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, to make him the Lord and Savior of your life, pray this prayer right now from your heart to the heart of God and say, dear God, in heaven, I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin, is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer, we rejoice with you. We say welcome into the family of God. You're now officially a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That is, hey, what does Zechariah say? Rejoice greatly and shout. And I want to tell you, if you prayed that prayer today, that's shouting ground. That's reason to rejoice greatly. Praise the Lord. You have literally passed spiritually speaking, from death unto life because of Jesus and what he did, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And of course, we'll tell the rest of the story on Easter Sunday about what meaneth these things. What, what, what were the transactions that happened? Not only spiritually, but even politically. One of the things that Easter Sunday and, good for, and all of that represent, we'll talk about that, you won't want to miss it.